Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Chiseled. And why do we call it Chiseled? Because we're all a work in progress. Hello again, I'm Rob Commodore. I'm your host. I'm also the author of Better Than You Think. And today I have a guest, Noel Banks from Canton, Georgia, which is about 30, 35 minutes north of Atlanta. Uh, Noel is a mother of three, married 26 and a half years. So it was 96 was a great year because we got my, me and my wife got married in 96 as well. So kudos to you, Noel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, definitely so, a great year. A great year. So uh, anyway, uh, 26 and a half years married. She's been in the real estate business for 20 years. And as many of you know, I do interview a lot of realtors because that's a big community I'm part of. But a lot of these realtors have some really cool stories. So that said, she's been in the business 20 years. and uh, But before that, she w- was a airline stewardess, if I said that right. Correct? Yeah, flight, flight attendant. Flight attendant. Flight attendant. There you go. <laughs> So flight attendant, and she's 20, some 24 years in that business, and, and that's a pretty cool business. So anyway, welcome to the show, Noelle. Thank you. Very honored to be here. Thanks for having me. And, and a little secret for everybody out there that won't be a secret anymore, this is her very first podcast that she's ever been interviewed <laughs> on. So we're excited to have her on. So Noelle, 24 years airlines, uh, I mean, I'm going to airlines still with us, a flight attendant, you're in the real estate business, so a lot there going on. So how did you get into the, the being a flight attendant? What attracted you to that? Um, I always had a very strong passion for travel and wanting to see the world and uh, knew that, you know, I didn't just wake up and inherit tons of money. So I had to find a way that I could really get around and see the world. So when I was 16 years old, I begged a local travel agent's office to let me work there for the summer. And long story short, they kept saying, no, no, we don't have any positions. No, no. And I kept saying, well, I can still help. I can still help. And eventually I think they got tired of me asking. And I said, I'll organize all your cruise brochures for $5 an hour. And he finally said, fine. And I did do that. And while I did that, I interviewed the travel agents there and said, I want to see the world. How do I do this? And I said, do do I become a travel agent? They said, no, you should be a flight attendant. And I thought, okay. So at 16, I decided I was going to go that route and ended up majoring in languages in college. I studied French, Italian, German, and Spanish and had my mindset on the whole time that I wanted to get out there and become a flight attendant to use it as a vehicle so that I could see the world. My my other passion was theater, but I didn't want to major in that because I didn't see that really going very far with that. Um, so that's that's what I did. I graduated from the University of Georgia in 98, and uh, they had on-campus, on-campus interviews for Delta Airlines right there at that time. They don't anymore. And I interviewed and got hired, and I have been a French and Italian speaker for Delta for, for many years. So you were a speaker or a translator speaker for Delta for Italian and French, did you say? French and Italian. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I knew you took that and, and, and had experience in this language. I didn't know. So did you, was it mean like a translator? Is that what happened? Is that what it yes, so it's, it's called a, um, a, lang- a language position on the flight. And so you are there to do the announcements in that language. And then if a passenger needs something translated or whatever, then that's what the speak, we call it the speaker position. So that's what the speaker is for. So I, I was a French and Italian speaker. I'm not so, currently, but I was, yeah. That's great. So then I'm assuming you did some international travel, not just domestic. Oh, yes. Primarily. In fact, I've done much more international than domestic because uh, it just worked out better to to fly those routes early on. But usually you can't unless you're a speaker. So I let I let that bypass all the kind of the, the paying the dues routes. <laughs> I got to bypass all of that having the language, thankfully. Good for you. That's great. We didn't talk about that. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I got to ask, what, what was your favorite spot you ever visited uh, while you're working for Delta? <laughs> Uh, it's hard for me to have a favorite anything, but I have favorites. So I, I still lo- love Rome, Italy. As many times as I've been there, I still love it. Um, and I'm not even a big history person, but anyone who's into history, that's got to be a, a must-see destination. I love Tel Aviv. I'll never get – that's probably one of my favorites is Tel Aviv. Um, wow. Hawaii is absolutely beautiful. And um, Iceland's pretty cool, but a lot, lot of cool spaces that places but those are some of my favorites but i i if i could pick any route and fly it all the time it'd probably be tel aviv well okay so then yeah. when you're doing this traveling and you're seeing these great spots like was there a sense of awe that you experienced doing that absolutely and that's why you know sometimes i uh, get to spend time with other crew members on a layover other times i'll just go by myself i just love seeing really God's creation. It's so different everywhere. I love experiencing different cultures, languages, traditions. 
just seeing different things. So I, um, in my profile that we do in our coaching company, my uh, highest trait is an explorer. And so that would make sense for, <laughs> for, for why I love what I do. Um, so yes, I, I take advantage of every opportunity. That is awesome. The explorer piece that brings out the uh, adventurous spirit in you, correct? Absolutely. So did you ever like pinch yourself and say, how could I be so lucky, you know, seeing the world and, and then speaking these languages and connecting with all these people? Was it, was it like, like another world? I, you know, it's become more of that in recent years. In my earlier years, you know, I kind of just, okay, I'm doing this. And I, you know, I liked it and I didn't appreciate it as much. And then uh, sometimes I would take certain leaves, whether it was when I had kids or things like that. And I realized, you know what, I don't ever want to give that up. That is a part of me. I will, I am, you know, really fulfilled seeing the world and I always want to have that accessible. So um, uh, go back to your question one more time. It was just what, what, like the sense, did you ever pinch yourself and like, yeah, did I, I, so, yeah. So in recent years, I have really come to appreciate that when I had breaks where I was off and I thought, I'm never going to just, you know, sleep on a layover again or something. I mean, okay. I'm, you know, extra, I'm, I am going to take advantage of any opportunities to get, cause you never know when you'll be able to go back or not. So that's so, yeah, great. That's what I'm trying to do because it's gotten really, really nice now. And have you been able to take the kids and, and, and on like these you know, cross the ocean flights or whatnot or national Many flights? Times. In fact, um, Brad he actually used to be a teacher at a private school. And so we found that that schedule with his schedule, having to teach and the kids there, it kind of limited a lot of that because we fly standby around the world. And so the summertime, it's kind of harder to do that. And so we, Brad actually had the idea to pull them out of the school and him leave teaching uh, back in 2015. And I thought it was crazy. And then it turned out to be the best decision in the world. And he said, we can give them a far better education traveling around the world. So that's what we did. So we've taken them everywhere. We, they got, my two older ones got to sit in the cockpit for a little bit before we left for Madrid, Spain once. And they went for two days and they zip lined in Toledo, Spain. And, um, but they have been to Greece. They've been to, you know, they've learned, they've walked through museums there all over New York, all over uh, France uh, Barcelona, we've gotten to take cruises, uh, transatlantic cruises around the world during school time because they do all online school now. So they've been doing that for a while, well before the pandemic. And we just decided this is, this is a better life for them. So it's worked great. That is amazing, man. How lucky, right? Or blessed, I'll say, right? That's great. Very simple. Yeah. So, okay. So now you try, you're a, a flight attendant and how did you get into real estate? Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> Um, I've always been somebody who does a lot of things at once and I do better when I juggle more at once. Um, when I was in high school, I was in 12 different clubs and I was an officer in four my junior year and I had, my GPA was my highest. My senior year, I thought, oh, I'll back off a little. My GPA went down slightly. It was still really good, but it went down. Slightly. What I learned about that is I do better when I'm juggling more. Uh -huh. So, um, I got a little bit bored flying. This was before I had kids. And I thought, I want a little something extra to do. And I asked a neighbor of mine who actually used to be a flight attendant with Delta, who owned a local Remax office. And she said, uh, and I said, can I just, I didn't know how things worked. And I just said, can I just come over there and answer phones for a few hours, you know, a couple times a week? And she said, well, it doesn't really work that way. She said, but I think you should get into real estate. And I thought, real estate? What? Huh? I, don't, I had no business mindset or training at all. None at all. Um, I was a language major into theater. Uh, nothing to do with business. And I said, I don't know about that. So she said, I think you should just do it. So I did. And for a year and a half, I kind of played around with it. Didn't really know much what I was doing until I encountered a uh, Brian Buffini seminar and that there was a connection there. He showed um, an excerpt from the movie, um, uh, Mr. Holland's Opus. Uh. And the girl that had the red hair and she was having trouble making connection, playing the music. And he said, what do people like about you? And she said, well, they say my hair looks like a sunset. And he said, close your eyes and play that sunset. And I, there was some connection that went off at that moment. And I knew this guy is, is more about more than just business. It's not just going to be the business world. There's something more to him. And I, and I knew that I, I just, it was just a connection. And so I said, that's it. I want to do what, what's going on here. And I, I, the person I came with at that time, the amount we had to pay for coaching, I had definitely wouldn't have, that was a lot of money to me then. <laughs> and I looked at that person. She told me, 
do it, sign up for coaching and don't ever look back. And I thought, and I trusted her and I said, okay. And I did. And I never, never did. I've been in coaching ever since. And that was in 2004. So. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And, and I got to go off a tangent here with this whole, like getting connected with this Buffini community and you're, you're 18 years ago. I was 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting. So like when I was back in college, uh, this is back in 1990, I was, I played baseball and we went to this little hole in the wall bar, uh, like whenever we could, it was called visions, you know, no pun there, but visions. Right. And so you have visions in the future, whatnot. But anyway, uh, they had the guy playing acoustic guitar and, uh, you, you yell out your, whatever you want him to play. And, and, he would play it. So I would always yell out cats in a cradle. And uh, you know, my, my dad would you know, work at three jobs and never get to hang out with him much or whatnot, but seven kids. So, you know, he had to do his thing, but uh, that cats in a cradle, I didn't want to be that guy. Right. So that was my song there. And then it's when I graduated college, got home, it was in 92. My mom, I go to a, pr a prayer meeting with my mom and I meet this priest and, and I'm struggling. I got like 53 bucks to my name. I got $30,000 in debt. And I'm like, father, I'm, I'm, I'm out of balance. I need some, I need some balance. I need some goals. I need to talk to somebody. So I go talk to him. And, and this is in 92. And this guy, the, the priest talks about, Hey Rob, you got to have goals. You got to have balance and harmony in your life. You got to have it in these five areas of your life. And so in our Buffini world, Brian talks about five areas of our lives. And I'm like, so this is 92. And when I'm talking about cats in a cradle and the goals with the priest and affirmations. So then I go to this Buffini event in 2001 or 2002, I think it was. Yeah. 2002. And he, he comes out and he's, like, he's talking about business the first half of the day and it's a two day event. And I, I didn't want to hear about the sales, the sales, the money, the money. I didn't want to hear all about that. I just wanted to, I wanted to be a better realtor, but I wanted to, I wanted something to fulfill me. And I was getting ready to leave. We go on lunch break and I had my hotel room paid for already. And I'm like, you know what? I'll just stay since I paid for it. We come back from lunch and he, he comes out on stage. He goes, well, this morning we talked about personal growth and I mean, uh, business fundamentals this afternoon, we're going to talk about personal growth and development. And he puts these five circles up on the screen and they're the same five circles as priest talked about 10 years earlier. Wow. And I'm like, all right, you got my attention now. You got my attention. And I'm like, okay, I'm connected. I'm in, I'm listening. And then I don't know, 15 minutes, half hour later, he says, all right, everybody, I'm going to play this song for you. And I want to, I want you to listen to the words and, and, and close your eyes. Listen to the words as I play it. And next thing you know, he puts cats in a cradle on the screen. Oh my. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I'm in, right. I mean, where, tell me where to sign. I'll press hard three copies. Tell me where to sign. So that you had that connection with Mr. Holland's opus. And I had that connection with this. So, Sorry that I went totally off tangent there, but I just think there's something in this community. There's something about it, right? That we, we're all connected and, uh, and and there's a lot of stories and ton of success stories here. So I'm sorry to do that, but I just want to share that moment with you. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so you're now you get into real estate. You said you know, that was 20 years ago. And in the meantime, you're still doing a little bit of, of being a flight attendant too, flying around the world, yeah. correct? Yeah. So now you're juggling the flight attendant and you're, and you're working, but real estate has taken one of the life of its own. You've done real well with it, right? Yes. Thankfully. Yes. Got a small team and you're very successful with it. And, and you might fly more, I guess what more, less than once a week, what a golf player does, right? Isn't that yes. what you told me earlier? <laughs> they still fly, you know, it's wonderful insurance and the flight benefits. We, we use it and greatly appreciate it. And I love it. It's part of who I am. It's a passion I have. Um, and I just, I love serving people and meeting people all over the world. Um, but uh, yeah, thankfully, because of my seniority and the language helped in the past so much too, but I fly very, very little now. So it's, it's a great opportunity to be able to keep it. Have you ever gotten a referral on the airplane? <laughs> um, I had Kevin, I had uh, John Buffini, Brian's brother on a flight. Oh, yeah? Actually, I had Bri Brian, uh, I wasn't working that flight that Brian was on. But coming out of one of the events, I, I was on the same plane with him. But uh, but I did have John Buffini in first class one time, and I note I noticed it on the the passenger sheet, and I had my personal notes on me, so I actually wrote him a note and left it in his seat while he was sleeping at night because it was an all nighter flight. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that is so that was great. pretty cool <laughs> so, that's awesome well look so anyway so now you're in real estate you've had a very you've been very successful as a flight attendant you're in real estate you're doing real well and then you get hit with a bombshell what about five five and a half years ago is that right yeah yeah 2017 so you want to tell me what happened tell us what happened yeah. so had a, a, a small little issue went to my doctor about it and she said well you can you do this little it, it's it, it's probably nothing or it's something and it turned out to be nothing. She told me what to do and it took care of it. But in the meantime, she said, how old are you again? And at that time I was 40 and 
I said, well, I just turned 40. And she said, have you had your first mammogram? And I said, no. And she goes, you should probably do that. And I said, well, okay. So I went and had my very first mammogram. And there you go. The uh, initial test they do, I forget, the screening is what they call a screening test. It looks suspicious. So then all of a sudden they said, we need you to go back and we're going to do a diagnostic one. So then they did, did a diagnostic and they said, well, we see something in there. We need you to do an MRI. And so after you, before you know it, I mean, I, I just went from this was going to be my first mammogram to I think it was roughly a week later, maybe it was a couple of weeks after all the tests. I got a call on a, a Friday morning from a the, and it wasn't like my doctor. It was just the one that did the test and she didn't have the greatest bedside manner. And just said, well, I just want to let you know, we did your test and you have breast cancer. So you need to go see a surgeon. And I thought, oh, okay, what? <laughs> yeah. I, I had no idea. Um, the little thing I went to my doctor about was not a symptom of it. But, you know, so I had no other symptoms. It was the strangest thing. And um, thankfully, I have a cousin who's a radiologist. And he was willing to look at my scans and kind of give me his direct person, because I trusted him, his right. take too. And he told me, yeah, this is what it is. And so... It was what they call DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, which means it's um, it's in situ means in place and the carcinoma is in the ducts. So it's, it was all ductal. It had not gotten into the tissue, which is very thankful for um, that. So the stage was actually zero. So the best stage you could have because it had not gone to the tissue, but there's also grades of cancer um, and it goes up to three. So mine was a grade three. So that means how differentiated the cells are and that type of thing. So it was a really nasty cancer, but because it was still contained in the ducts and had not gotten into the tissue, I was extremely fortunate, but there was 10 centimeters of it in one side. So there was no question I had to have a mastectomy on that side. As they said, wow. you can't, can't work around that. It's all gotta go. So I ended up having a bilateral mastectomy and reconstruction and um, they, they checked a few lymph nodes, actually had to take some lymph nodes from my chest area and some from, you know, the, this, the arm area where they normally do. And thankfully the pathology came back and it was all clear in the nodes. So um, my surgeon declared me cancer free. After that, I did not have to have chemo or radiation. I'm extremely thankful for that. Um, because I had a bilateral mastectomy, I did not have to take a drug called tamoxifen, which I otherwise would have. And it's very good that I didn't because it makes you very pr pr prone to blood clots. And I ended up having a blood clot two and a half weeks after my surgery, which was another major, major issue for the next six months. <laughs> wow. so, but the surgery was major. And because of the reconstruction, um, I had to use a walker for a few weeks. I had to do physical therapy for six weeks. Um, you get, you often get a thing called frozen shoulder. So thankfully I, I was, that was starting to happen. So I had to go through all that. Um, but it was really six months of emotional challenge <laughs> to yeah. say. Um, but what was interesting is I was diagnosed that Friday. It was Cinco de Mayo. And that Monday we were supposed to go to peak our, our peak, uh, experience, uh, seminar that a lot of us go to. And I didn't even know if I could mentally do it. And I put a post out on our white hats page and the response I got was so overwhelmingly supportive. I thought that's it. I'm going. So I traveled three days later, terrified. My youngest son was four at the time. I just, and the outpouring of love and support from some people I did know, some people I hadn't even met yet was astounding and like no other community. And I I'm around some really nice communities, whether it's neighbors, friends, people from church, et cetera. But this community was astounding. And one person had a whole um, kind of like a fundraiser for me while I was there. That was Trisha Solitz. I hadn't even met her yet before. Um, she was, but she was a nurse. I think she kind of understood. She had kids, she empathized. And it was amazing. The, the things that some people, some people gave me uh, flowers, some sent chocolates. I, I was just like, wow. And I walked out of there with a sense of peace and confidence that I just, I, I wouldn't have necessarily uh, heard otherwise. Darlene Perry gave me a bracelet, beautiful bracelet that was about strength and everything right off her arm. And she said, I want you to have this. I mean, just amazing things. Christy Davis gave me a gift bag because her mother had had breast cancer. I just, I, I keep thinking of all these people that did wonderful things. So anyways, very grateful. 
That's that's incredible. And and just so again, another side note, if, if people can hear this, that she's ripping off these names that, that she's met over the years at these events. And, and we are, I mean, a pretty cool community. And from a business standpoint, one out of every eight houses in America is sold through somebody in this community. And it's not a cult. You know, people say, hey, you're tied up in that cult. It's, it's just a great community of givers of of people that just their kindred spirit and they know how to treat people treat each other care for each other it's just like you said a loving community so thank you for sharing that part of it. i'm sure brian will like that right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh but anyway so now so you get this diagnosis and you hear the big c word and, uh, and like you said you you pause it what what like cancer so what, what like what's the first like the first thought in your mind what, what goes through your mind immediately I was 100% shocked because mm -hmm. thinking I just went for a normal thing that everybody goes through when they, you know, and then it ended like this. I, it was just in, you know, stages of grief, but absolute denial and shock because I, I couldn't understand how that would have happened. Um, and then I started to just think about, you know, okay, this is going to be terminal. I, I kind of, I had this mindset that, okay, almost all cancer is going to be that way. And um, started thinking about my kids and just what am I going to do? And really just kind of panic. But I knew that, um, you know, I had uh, begun, I had been raised in a Catholic church background, actually. Um, and, but I didn't have a personal relationship with God until I was 12. And, um, but when I was 12, it was, I, it was a very, um, I knew what I was doing when I turned, turned my life around and said, I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus basically. And I have ever since. And so he had provided me with a peace that passes all understanding. Um, I remember that it, when I arrived at that peak, Brian Buffini had left a book for me um, by uh, uh, his wife went through cancer and I can't get the name. I'll think of it in a minute, but um, it was, was it what to say? No. Um, anyways. Chad, Chad Hestel, or what to say? You talk to yourself? Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking of. Yeah, no, it's um, Lou, Lou Tice. Lou Tice. Yeah, the smart, smart talk. Smart talk. Smart talk with Lou Tice. Thank you. Yeah. So, and his wife went through breast cancer. So he, so that was really, really helpful. And just what you allow to go on in your head between your two ears is really important. Um, and what you say. And um, so, all of that just really, really helped me, but I, I, it was still scary going through it. And of course my surgery was a nine hour surgery and it would have been a 12 hour, but I had a married couple that was a team that did my surgery. So it was actually about nine hours instead of 12. So it was, it was daunting, yeah, <laughs> but, I can imagine. but when I came out, I felt good. And, um, honestly, it's hard for me to remember cause I was under, you know, all the pain medications, but my mother and, and Brad will tell you that when I came out, the first thing I said uh, was, okay, I made it. I want how can I help somebody else with it? And that really was my heart was how can I share and help someone else to help them get through it? Because so many people had helped me. That's amazing. So, so speaking of which, you know, you're going to do that. That's what's happening right now with this podcast. You're going to help somebody and this is part of it, right? Uh, I, I definitely want that to happen. Yes. <laughs> right, well, we're, we, before we leave today, you're going to give people your information if they want to get, you know, get a hold of you, talk to you about this whole situation and whatnot. So, but that's, that's, it's awesome to share. So was there ever a why me moment? Um, I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't remember like sulking in that. I, I remember being surprised, but I guess my mind always goes into problem solving instead of going backwards, if that makes any sense. Yes. So um, it was interesting because in October of that same year of 17, Brian Buffini had a podcast with Dr. Joel Furman. And I was listening to that podcast and about 45 minutes long. And when I heard him say that up to 90% of cancers are preventable, it was another light bulb moment in my life. And I went, what? I thought it was just kind of a luck of the draw. And it, it started a path where I dove into research, deep into research, and actually flew up to New Jersey and saw Dr. Furman several times. Um, and uh, Dr. Benson is his side uh, doctor. And so they they both helped me. They helped educate me. Um, it's a lot to go into, but if anyone ever needs the resources, I have them. But uh, basically, I learned that your lifestyle, diet, exercise, sleep, toxins that you expose yourself to, et cetera, et cetera, have a whole lot more to do with cancer than just genetics. Now there are five to 10% of cancers, as he will tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting what Dr. Furman said, that are just, it's a genetic thing. It does, it's not lifestyle related. 
but a strong, strong percentage of it is. And that gave me hope actually, because then I realized, oh, there's a lot I can, thankfully I, you know, things were clear after the major surgery. And so it gave me hope that, Hey, I can make changes so that I don't have to do this again and to help other people so that hopefully I can help prevent somebody from going through this again. Um, so that's what I did. We turned, I immediately turned my, my lifestyle around. It was a little drastic for some of my family, but I knew that's what I had to do. And, um, eventually Brad within six months, totally started changing the way he eats and my kids do now too. And my, my youngest doesn't even know how we ate before. <laughs> um, uh. and they're very, very aware of, you know, mom, yeah, we read the ingredients on this, you know, and uh, they're very aware of things now. So it's been really good for them. That's interesting because uh, like when I was getting ready to ask you, I think you pretty much answered the question because some people might say, you know, oh, this happened to me. This happened to me. And I answered you had the, uh, you know, like a why, is, why me or what was me moment. And the next question, the follow up question I was going to ask you was what did this do for you? Yeah. Because things happen, you know, people think, oh, this happens to me, but no, they happen for you. And I would say you answered that and tell, telling us how you changed your diet and how you, know, like you, you guys, the whole family eats healthy. And you're telling a bunch of people right now that it's, it's, it's good to eat healthy if you want to prevent cancer to some yeah. degree. Yeah. And, and the other fun fact that Dr. Furman shared was 99.5% of heart disease is preventable with diet. So really great way to prevent, it's much easier to prevent heart disease than cancer, but great hope for people out there with who think cancer is always terminal. It doesn't have to be. That's funny. And you, and you bring that up, the, the Furman book, because uh, I, I was at one of the events when he talked about Furman and all the food. And remember, he gave out a Vitamix or he sold Vitamixes yes. one time at, yes. at one of those events. And I bought one at that event. But anyway, I, I was cleaning up my bookshelves this past weekend and I came across the Furman book and I just, I'm looking at it right now across from where we're talking. It's yeah. on one of my shelves right now. So that's good stuff. So, yes. so, so I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that, that, that was mostly it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So now, okay, you, you got, you get the diagnosis, you get through it. Now you're eating well, you're doing well again. And, and here we are six years later. And so what can you share that you haven't shared yet as far as the eating one, what you could share with people about going through this process, the mental, the mental strength you have to have to take yourself through it. Can you share anything about that? I think it's so important that you surround yourself with people who will support you unconditionally and love you unconditionally in life for any, you know, for all sorts of reasons, not just if you get a diagnosis, but in general, you know, no man is an Island. We're designed to be around people. And, and um, it's really important who you choose to surround yourself with on a, on a consistent basis. Um, which is one of the reasons why I so very much value our white hat community and Buffini and company. So, um, and, and then I have some communities that are local that, you know, are great friends and family and that type of thing. So I think that's really important. I think it's important to, um, to know, and in, in my personal experience that there is a God and he loves us and he has a plan and not every plan turns out the way we might want or expect, or, um, you know, can foresee, but he's got a plan. And I, you know, I've seen some situations where people had something and it didn't go well at the end, but boy, did they leave an impact. Their life left an impact. Um, I think it brings about a great awareness of the fragility of life and the, the uh, temporary or, you know, the sh how short life is and that we need to embrace every moment, um, you know, and in the best way, I, I think just being grateful is is a life changer. And I have to remind myself of that daily, too. It's not like I've got it all mastered by means. But anytime I get a little funky or off, I need to just think, OK, what do I need to be grateful for? Now, when you got that diagnosis, were you able to do it in that moment? Um, maybe not that exact moment. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I had to come out of shock a little bit. Right. And I it started kicking in when I got to the event three days later. Okay. Um, it, it was more, I, I, to be honest, I think I was a little bit more afraid, but not, you know, angry. I, I think it was just a little bit more afraid, just still being in shock, but, but not total fear because I know, I know who my maker is and I, I know, you know, my, what, ha, will ha, where I'm going to when I die. And that's what I believe. So um, I have a piece in that. Um, so, 
because of that, you know, it still it can still be scary. And, you know, it's not fair to say, oh, you'll feel just fine, you know, but it's not that you go through emotions, but there's an, a, an underlying peace. And like, like Jesus calls it, it's a peace that passes all understanding. You can't understand it, but it's just a peace that you have that, okay, one way or the other, I'm going to just take this day by day and I'm going to get somewhere with it. And I'm, I'm so grateful I am where I am now. I mean, so yeah. And you just have this great energy about you sharing this and, and, and I can see the piece, you know, coming through the screen here. So thank you. It's uh, it's good. Cause I think, you know, we, we all have this level of anxiety you know, that we, I don't want to say we can either tolerate or we just go through and like the smallest thing can send some people way off. The largest things can just maybe barely affect somebody. So we're all at different places. So when we have these anxious moments and you can dive into that relationship, that's what I think is so powerful. And you've exemplified that with, from what you said today. Yeah. Yeah. I got to ask you a question though, before, before we wrap this up, you said at age 12, I'm going backwards now at age 12, you accepted Christ. It was it something happened back then that you said, you know what, I, I want to do this. You were raised Catholic, but it sounds like at age 12, something happened. Can you share that with us? Yep. So, um, I was exposed. So I was born in upstate New York in Utica and lived there until I was about nine, nine ish. And then we moved to the Atlanta area because my dad was tired of shoveling snow <laughs> and there was, <laughs> sun and opportunity in Atlanta for him. And it's been great for us. But so we moved here. And then a couple of years later, he was actually invited to a church that was just non-denominational. And um, it, it struck a chord with him. And so he started bringing us, it was a little shock for my mother who had only been in a Catholic church for 40 something years. <laughs> and, um, but it, we went and it was the first time that we had personally been exposed to, Hey, you can have a personal relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I want to be very clear and, and sensitive to the fact that there are plenty of Christians who are Catholics. I'm not saying you're, you're not, but I'm just saying my experience was that I just didn't experience a personal relationship there. And I did, um, when we went to this non-denominational church. Um, so now the, the church that where I'm at now that this wasn't at the time, it didn't exist at the time is part of Andy Stanley's church, uh, North Point Ministries throughout the country. So he's one of the uh, most significant pastors out there in the country today. He has a, a show after Saturday Night Live called Your Move with Andy Stanley. It's really good if anyone wants to check it out. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was a non-denominational. It was, it was the relationship. It wasn't just religion, but relationship. And that's yeah. where I, learned I can talk to God. And, and, uh, and it's the most important relationship in my life, you know. So um that so what so somebody at that at church at that time had said you know if you'd like to invite Jesus to live you know be in your life then that's what I did, um, and I just and I I could feel the Holy Spirit personally in my life ever since then and I just I've had that connection ever since. I right, go for you because because I think yeah because I was going to ask is it the church or is it the choice you know is it the it's the church that, that you know, helps you have that relationship or is it the choices we make I know you talked about being surrounded by people um, and what, what would you say to that I think the church was a facilitator to to allow for that opportunity mm -hmm. but I think the difference was the choice I made it's just but sometimes you know people aren't exposed they wouldn't know about the choice so I think yeah. it helped yeah, to facilitate that. But no, I think it's definitely the choice I made. And even though I was 12, I was very serious about that. I, I, you know, I think even at that time I had started using like a little bit of bad language or something at 12 years old. And I had, I said no more. And I stopped that. I was very conscious about, you know, who were going to be my friends. Um, the dating path I take when I, when I went to, um, university of Georgia, I didn't, nothing wrong with a fraternity or sorority, but I didn't go that route. I knew of a, a group called Bulldog Christian Fellowship. And so I thought I'm jumping right into that. And I, I, I've been very intentional about all my surroundings, friends, people, anyone I dated, the, you know, Bulldog Christian Fellowship churches. I've always been very intentional about who I surround myself with. Yeah. Um, and I think it's made a huge difference in my life. Because yeah, I, well, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, like, you know, I mean, I'm Catholic, born and raised Catholic. Always, you know, I plan on always being Catholic. So I don't know that it, it, it uh, you know, it, it's the people and the choices you make, the people you're surrounded with and choices you make, I think that, you know, help guide you and, 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 and feel that. Cause I totally believe the Holy Spirit's involved in all of this, you know, and, uh, 
And I, I believe that's what kind of started this podcast, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> just, ha- just having a moment, a Holy Spirit moment. And it's been really good. So thank you for sharing that because, you know, we do, I think it is a choice that we make at some point. And it's a, a, a kind of who we surround ourselves with or who connects with us at some time, at any point in time. But, uh, you know, I think we have to make that decision to have that relationship with Christ. And you would agree with that, I think. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah so the last, to, oh, sorry. To, know, to know about it and then, and then make the choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So before I leave you today, I'm going to ask you, how much more chiseling do you have going on in your life? Oh, plenty, plenty, <laughs> plenty <laughs> of for me to grow in many ways. Um, thankfully I've come a long way in some areas and I've still got a long way to go in others, but you know, it's, it's a work in progress. God's, God's working on me in progress. So. Yeah. Well, that's the subtitle of this podcast because we're all work in progress. And so I didn't pay you to say that either. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> that's right. So right. T- timely phrase there. Thank you for sharing that. So, hey, Noel, if people wanted to get a hold of you, and I'm sure you welcome that. How could they get a hold of you? Yep. So um, you can reach me. Our website is www.thebanksteam.com. And then my phone number is 404 388 3961. And you've been a pleasure and a joy to talk to you today. And congratulations on getting through your first podcast. I think you did awesome. And yeah, and you're going to impact and inspire so many people. So I'm really grateful for you. Oh, thank you. I hope so. And I've any, I had complete strangers from across the country that helped me when I started my journey. So I, I want to be there. And even if I'm a complete stranger to someone to help you too. So that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Thank you, Noel. Look, you. everybody, I appreciate Noel being here today. Thank you for listening today. And until next time, everyone, let's go get chiseled.